Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we hope that you and your loved ones are doing well and are keeping safe during these challenging times. I'm Kavita Vej, Head Communication at KNS Partners. Thank you for sparing your valuable time to be part of this very important webinar through the lens, a discussion on piracy and copyright issue. I will read out some house rules for this session. Uh, attendees may please place all their questions in the Q&A box visible on your respective dashboard. Please mention your name and company name along with your question. Please also mention name of the speaker to whom the question is addressed. In the interest of time and more questions, we'll prefer questions coming into the Q&A box. I would now like to invite Mr. Jyoti Sagar, founder and managing partner of KNS Partners and chairman and founder J Sagar Associate. Jyoti has been practicing law since 1976 and is a highly acclaimed IP lawyer with around 45 years experience. Jyoti founded KNS Partners in 1994. Uh, KNS is a IP boutique with over 120 professionals who are lawyers and technology domain experts in all five offices in India. Jyoti also founded corporate commercial practice J Sagar Associates in New Delhi in 1991 as a solo practitioner. Jyoti has led teams on significant assignments of the firms, providing both hands-on legal as well as overall strategic inputs. Jyoti has extensive experience in a range of practice areas, including IP, foreign investment, and joint ventures and technology transfers. Jyoti has worked on several policy issues and has been actively associated with various committees of Government of India and Chambers of Commerce. Jyoti uh, today will be delivering welcome remarks and set the context of today's session. May I now request Jyoti to please introduce Honorable Mr. Justice Manmohan and set the context of the webinar. Over to you, Jyoti. Uh, thank you, uh, Kavita. Uh, friends, uh, it's a matter of great honor and privilege uh, for me to introduce our guest of honor, uh, Justice Manmohan. Uh, he is an alum of uh, Hindu College, uh, Delhi, where he received a degree of uh, BA Honours in History. And from there, he went on to receive his LLB degree from the Compass Campus Law Center, Delhi University. Uh, he commenced his practice in 1987 uh, at the High Court uh, uh, of Delhi and at the Supreme Court, and the, in areas of civil, criminal, constitutional, taxation, arbitration, trademark and service matters. Uh, he was uh, the senior panel uh, advocate for the government of India in uh, High Court of Delhi and in the Supreme Court of India. He was designated as senior advocate by High Court of Delhi in 2003. Uh, during his 20 years of distinguished practice, he handled many landmark cases, including the Hyderabad Nizam's jewelry trust case, the Bowl Power Company, uh, high profile family disputes of Modi family and the Claridge's Hotel. He was appointed a judge of the High Court of Delhi in 2008. Uh, Justice Manmohan is a frequent speaker at national and international conferences and events. He serves on several committees in the country and uh, internationally, uh, mostly concerning IP laws. Over the years, Justice Manmohan's thoughtful and what I may call a refreshing uh, approach to intellectual property rights and their enforcement uh, has been uh, a great inspiration for us in the IP fraternity. Uh, sir, uh, I extend to you a very warm welcome and thank you so much for being here with us uh, uh, this afternoon. Uh, I will take a few minutes to set the broader context. Uh, we are now in the fourth industrial, or call it economic revolution. The first was driven by steam, textiles and railroads, and the outcome was organized manufacturing. The second was driven by electricity, with steel and petroleum as the key industries and mass, mass production was a striking outcome. The third was driven by electronics and information technology uh, with large scale automation of production as its outcome. And now we are in the fourth revolution, 
is driven by digital, robotics, internet of things, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and you know, the outstanding feature actually is disruption. It is the nature and speed and scale of change that has never been seen before. How different is the digital revolution and the digital economy from what we've experienced in the pre-digital era? Just, just look at a few numbers. Uh, Domo uh, publishes and updates data about the internet yearly, but their most recent report is April 2020. Uh, the, this year one is expected soon. It shows that almost 60% of the world's population has access to the internet with something like uh, 4.5, 4 4.6 billion active users and a large number of them. Uh, 4.2 billion or more are on mobile and over 3.8 billion use social media. And every minute on the internet, the following happens. Let's see, Netflix. 400,000 hours of video streaming. YouTube, 500 hours of video uploaded by users. WhatsApp, almost 42 million messages are shared. And a very large number of those are with some sort of media content. Instagram, almost 350,000 stories are posted every minute. And you know what, uh, quite a bit of that is uh, actually happening and originating right here in India. Uh, so we have how many, about 700 million internet users and it's up from 300 million in 2015. And it's expected to reach 930 million by 2025. Uh, we are currently in this country using data, data usage per month per user in 2020. Uh, uh, was 13.5 GB. Uh, leading mobile activity is watching online videos. Active social media users are almost 450 million. And the leading site is YouTube. Now, all of these are enormous, impressive numbers. Turning for a moment to the foundational principles of copyright and its protection, Substantial resources in terms of talent, energy, and money are invested in creating products. And if the right holders do not have adequate opportunity to recover or a proper reward, they won't have much incentive to create more. And that leads to reduced creativity and the society will not benefit from the creative talent. So that is the broad, as you know, the rationale for the laws that we have for protection of intellectual property. Now, talking of piracy and copyright piracy, it is not, not at all new. Uh, it's been there as we know forever. But the difference is that what happened for 200 years or more in the, during the 19th and the 20th centuries, and now is that for a long time, the relatively high cost duplicate and distribute copyrighted matter was in beat print, music films, you know, was limited, it limited the scope and impact of piracy. Uh, but, but now from late 20th century onwards, the new technologies have reduced, if not completely in some cases eliminated the costs and the time associated with reproduction, dissemination and distribution of copyrighted content. Uh, as you know, beginning from the cassette tapes and photocopying machines in the 60s, adoption of Betamax and VHS recorders in 70s and 80s. It allowed users to make copies of films, distribute on tape and to record television and movie content from television broadcasts, for example. The digitization of content uh, from, uh, in the internet from the late 90s and the explosion as we have all seen has radically changed the ecosystem of piracy. Internet-based piracy of digital goods is unrestrained by any physical media or distance. And it also therefore becomes significantly more difficult to combat. So it is more disruptive, an outcome of the digital world that I mentioned earlier. And not to forget the current pandemic scenario, uh, piracy levels have zoomed along with Zoom calls. 
in a paper produced last year by the USPTO, which was called the Economic Working Paper Number 2020-02. The authors, uh, that's Brett Danaher, uh, Michael uh, Smith, and Rahul Telang, they presented information about the economic harm caused by piracy of US produced films each year. And what they noticed was that there are approximately 26 billion illegal pirated viewings of US produced films, as well as hundred and almost 130 billion viewing of US produced television shows. The authors kind of estimated that it causes a loss of approximately 30 billion to $70 billion per year, which implies also losses of jobs, 230,000 to 560,000 lost jobs in the US each year. I do not have at hand recent numbers uh, of any, uh, for any similar study for Indian film industry, but I'm sure that uh, in our program later today, the panelists may give us some more indication about that. So why I'm saying all this is because it shows technology is dramatically changing the landscape, the industry and the consumer behavior. Today, we will talk about these dramatic changes uh, which are impacting the creation, management and protection of IP rights and the multiple issues and challenges that, uh, that follow. And as all we know, as lawyers, we know that law is always trailing technology. And therefore these challenges become very, very interesting for us to discuss and see what, what will happen next. So with that, uh, uh, we turn to the first segment of the program this evening. Uh, I invite uh, Justice Manmohan to share with us his thoughts to set the tone and direction of our conversations uh, this evening. Uh, over to you, sir. Thank you. Respected Mr. Jyoti Sagar, Ms. Kavita. Mr. Anil, Ms. Lohita, Mr. Rajinder Kumar, Mr. Zameer, Mr. Prashant Gupta, and Mr. Akshay Alak. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for showing extreme patience. On 23rd April, which was the initial scheduled date for this discussion, I was detected with COVID. Thereafter, there was a bereavement in the family. I'm really humbled by the confidence that has been shown by the organizers. The topic is very interesting. In fact, copyright law has assumed great amount of significance in the recent years. Some years ago, I had read a quotation in Copija and James, which I think is very apt. Uh, it was to the effect that copyright is the Cinderella of intellectual property laws. A rich elder sister's trademarks and patents had pushed her for a long time into a chimney corner. Suddenly, the fairy godmother of invention endowed her with digital devices in an online world, just like her famous or magical pumpkin coach and the mice footprint. And now she's the queen of the IP world. As a judge, or in fact, as a lawyer, I have wondered, why do judges sit on a higher pedestal? The only answer that I've been able to find is that they're supposed to look at the big picture and not lose focus. Consequently, I think the first point to be understood in this discussion or to be conveyed in this discussion is, what is the rationale or the intent behind the Copyright Act or the Copyright Law. The intent and the object is to promote 
human ingenuity and human creativity. Copyright acts world over, including our Copyright Act, in, in a sense confers a bundle of exclusive rights on the owner creator and provides remedies in case the rights are infringed. Consequently, the copyright law promotes creation of works like literary, dramatic, musical, films, sound recordings by providing exclusive rights to the owners and creators. Jyoti just mentioned the four revolutions. And really, I think in this age of digital revolution, internet, big data, machine learning, the significance of this act has increased manifold. In fact, in the short opening, I will try to examine the, or just try to flag for you, the scientific and technological advances that have taken place, both in the context of piracy and the copyright law. First, let's deal with the issue of piracy. See, digital devices in a virtual world have ensured a very large audience for creative works. But they have also facilitated copying at a scale and speed which was previously unimaginable. Distance and national boundaries have today ceased to exist. Piracy is a global epidemic. Jyoti just pointed out the figures and uh, when I was doing some matters, a lot of figures were pointed out to us. And really, the situation is pretty bad. And India is no exception. The general industry evidence appears consistent with the hypothesis that digital piracy has hurt the industry world over. But there are many issues that one has to grapple with. One is whether online world is the same as a physical world. Many scholars believe that internet is a unique highway or a separate space, which they call the cyberspace, to be left totally free, without any controls, unrestricted. They believe this space should be left free to be used by an infringer or by a law-abiding citizen simultaneously. And they give the instance of a highway, say whether a decoit uses it or the policeman uses it or a law-abiding citizen uses it, you don't touch them. Followers of the school believe that internet is first and foremost about individual freedom, not about collective responsibility. They believe that if an intermediary or an internet service provider is tasked with the responsibility of identifying and taking action against infringing content, it would have a chilling effect on free speech. However, in my opinion, and that's what I said in a judgment once, that if the view of the internet exceptionalists, as they are called, is to be accepted, then a boon like cyberspace could turn into a disaster. Courts normally have been applying the principle of necessary and proportionate application while dealing with the issue of piracy and infringement. This test or principle requires a fair balance to be struck between competing fundamental rights. That means the right to intellectual property on the one hand and the freedom to trade and freedom of expression on the other. Just as supporting bans on import of ivory or cross-border human trafficking does not make one a protectionist, supporting website blocking or sites dedicated to piracy does not make one an opponent of 
free and open internet. Consequently, advocating limits on, on accessing illegal content does not violate open internet principles. There is also another view, which is that many believe that website blocking is an exercise in futility as website operators shift the sites and therefore they say any action taken is like a whack-a-mole whack effect. But countries which try to protect intellectual property rights have tried to deal with the menace of digital online piracy by working with internet intermediaries as the main solution. Sometime back, I had an interesting occasion to deal with the concept of dynamic injunction in UTV software matter. Just to give a little background, suppose a court, a court were to pass an injunction against a website called T. T does not appear in court, does not depend on the action. But what it does is, it creates a mirror website by the name of T1 and diverts all the business and all its activities, its customers to T1. These mirror websites with alphanumeric variation have the same content what the initial infringing website had. So by using this dynamic injunction, what the plaintiffs tried to do was they tried to use new means and they try to block new means of accessing the same infringing material. So there is piracy which is on the increase and due to scientific and technological advance, it is difficult to meet that challenge. But some innovative thinking has to go into it. And that I saw when when this dynamic injunction concept was shown and, and we tried to put it in practice in India. At another level, science and technology advances are challenging the core concepts of intellectual property laws. As I said, the, the real essence of copyright law is to promote human ingenuity and human creativity. But when machine starts creating works, then what happens? I recently heard of digital art and the new rules of digital ownership. Uh, the concept of non-fungible tokens. If nearly your whole world is virtual, it makes sense to spend money on virtual stuff. You must have read about the increased autonomy of artificial intelligence in the creation of artistic works, interplay between AI and IP laws, in particular the possibility of providing IP protection to AI generated inventions. Last two years have seen the emergence of several high quality AI generated creative works. David Cope's ME, which he calls the experiment in musical intelligence software, has created uh, realistic melodies in the style of Beethoven and Mozart. An artificial neural network has created a sophisticated artwork in the style of Rafi. And an AI program in Japan wrote a short no novel that has passed the first round of national literary competition. Consequently, the advance in science and technology is, in, is impacting us in more than one way and not necessarily in the same direction. As I said, at the one end of the spe spectrum is the increase in piracy 
and the other end of the spectrum is the challenge to the fundamental concept of copyright law. In either situation, law is lagging behind technology by a few light years. And I think this is the point in essence which Mr. Jyoti Sagar also emphasized. Another challenge one faces, and when you sit as a judge, when you're hearing all these matters you find is that while IPR laws are territorial, they can be violated by an infringer just because he has committed the infringement through a server hosted abroad. And he knows that courts where infringement has taken place will take no action against him. And what you find is the moment the infringer jumps jurisdiction, it is difficult to take action against him. Keeping in view of this, I, uh, I, I don't mean as a high court judge, but as a student of law, I feel it is time for a neutral agency like United Nations or WIPO to prepare a model IPR law for the entire world. After all, United Nations Commission on International Trade Law adopted a model law on international commercial arbitration and conciliation rules, which was subsequently adopted by a number of countries, including India, with certain modifications. So, in conclusion, I would like to say that Copyright Act is a very important act. And as Kopinger said, it whirls through the mad maze of a glamorous hall at this moment. And we really need to keep pace with the ground level reality, which I think is changing very, very fast in that. And in the next 10 years to 15 years, with 3D, cryptocurrency, and all the inventions that are taking place, many fundamental concepts are going to be challenged. We really need a good relook at them. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Justice Manmohan. I think it really does set the tone and the direction for uh, uh, our conversations this evening. So. So to begin with, it's uh, we we called it a, a fireside chat. Uh, there is no fires per se, but I think other kinds of fires are burning, which we don't like to talk about. But it is a chat just where I'm going to be asking you a few questions. And there are really two areas in which I'm going to uh, direct my questions. One is uh, a few questions uh, and which actually uh, emanate in a way from your two of your many path-breaking judgments and uh, decisions uh, on intellectual property law. And the other one is, which is a matter of great concern to the IP fraternity, is the expedition of resolution of IP disputes. And with some just developments as of last month, which may actually have made that a little bit more complicated. So, uh, so let me uh, then turn to uh, something that you already in a way described a bit in your uh, in your opening remarks and the question of dynamic injunction and we understand the the context and the and the circumstances in which you uh, uh, you moved forward in a very bold uh, thing because uh, it had not been done in india and uh, the other countries where this thing has happened particularly singapore uh, is based on uh, on uh, on a law that they have whereas uh, you actually went ahead and uh, uh, picked up the, uh, I would say, you know, it was the, in a way, in a very uh, uh, courageous and far reaching uh, judgment to say that we can apply those rules here. The question to which you have also alluded, but I like uh, you to spend a little bit more time uh, on that with us is this entire issue of identification of a rogue website. And you do talk about a qualitative versus a quantitative uh, uh, decision and how you actually 
uh, uh, while and in terms of talking about the proportion, uh, proportionality that you discussed, that how do you how how, how do we deal with the, the the context? You know, the collateral damage, the fear, uh, collateral damage concerns that such as impact on legitimate third party content if we have whole scale uh, a whole scale uh, banning of uh, websites, so to say. So I wanted you to kind of tell us a little bit more as to what you think about this entire issue of identification of rogue websites, what you think should be uh, the key considerations. You do mention them in your judgment, but hearing from you in terms of bit of analysis and how you got to those conclusions would be very enlightening for us. Uh, I'll just give you a interesting facet of it. When the matter was being argued, the learned Amicus, Mr. Heaven Singh, uh, made a submission that only those sites which have 100% infringing content should be injuncted. If they had some legitimate content, they should be spared. And he advanced an argument which it seemed quite plausible that you should not be seen as curbing freedom of speech. But the fear that, that I had as a judge was and I have written it in my judgment also. But suppose a predominantly infringing site, say who has 95% infringing content, includes 5% legitimate content, would it be spared? Would it escape the injunction? If that were so, then all infringing sites would include a minuscule original content and try to defy the injunction order or try to prevent an injunction order being passed. In this judgment, I lay down certain illustrative tests. And I also emphasize that it is not the quantitative test that will apply, it's the qualitative test that will apply. That is, for instance, what is the extent of infringement on that website? What is the primary purpose of that website? And in most of the cases, nearly in, in nearly all that were dependents before me, we found that the detail of the registrant was masked. We also found that in nearly 95% of the defendants, Injunction orders had been passed by courts world over. And none of those injunctions had been abided by. And in none of the proceedings, the defendants had appeared. So they were demonstrating a disregard for the law. Generally, And they also contain guides or instructions to circumvent any order that was passed by the court. As I said, there was an injunction, suppose against website T, they just floated T1. If you passed an injunction against T1, they would float it T1A. These are alphanumeric websites that were being used. They don't appear, but they just change their names at the speed of light. And the courts are finding it difficult to keep pace with them. Therefore, sir, these tests were, were mentioned by way of illustration. But the real intent was to ensure that somehow copyright infringement must be curbed to a large extent. And I'm happy at one thing that Courts are administered by judges who can take into account various imponderables and various 
facts which differ from case to case rather than uh, an ai system which will just treat certain fact which will just look into certain factors and take a decision so i think these are illustrative factors and it depends on case to case the real intent is that what is the primary purpose of that website is it to facilitate infringement then it surely needs to be banned and this is what i call the hydra headed monsters well i uh, thank you so much for that i had uh, one kind of a question which actually comes uh, from this is that we are dealing with the situation that you just mentioned of anonymity they are these are anonymous and therefore uh, even though we call it a dynamic injunction but it has to be issued against a fixed entity it has to be issued against a known entity so in this case uh, you know as your judgment says the known entities are the isps because somebody has if if we say that there are people are setting up rogue websites then we don't know who those rogues are but it is the medium of the isp that the rogues reach out to everyone else so you can only people you can actually direct or control are the isps and uh, 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 the and, and the judgment actually does record that to say that isps should be directed to take down these uh, these websites now the question is that in terms of therefore domain names for example uh where uh again you can have bit of anonymity uh, the bombay high court if you remember uh, took that decision in the unilever hindustan unilever and endurance uh, domains case uh, where they declined to issue a kind of a you know very flexible injunction uh, they said well because the the registrar has no control over who will obtain the name and in in what circumstances therefore once the name is done then you can come and uh, and you can come and uh, complain so in terms of uh, the extension of the dynamic injunction concept in other forms of uh, ip uh, particularly let's say even you know a bit referring to trademarks or to, to other copyright uh, issues uh, what is what's your view i mean did you did you so do you agree with the bombay high court judgment on domain uh, names that there are limitations to what we can do under dynamic injunctions or there are possibilities of extending it further pushing the envelope a bit more see the domain names operates in a slightly different field in the sense its mechanism is totally different it is machine led it is automated so there are certain constraints over there number one number two most of these most of the time the domain name may not after registration may not be an active person in the sense he may not be act, actually infringing anyone's name or someone may be just doing domain squatting as we call it. someone finds that there is a eminent politician and they just take a domain registration in his name it's like squatting but they are not doing any activity under his name there is a slight amount of difference over there and the court the bombay high court has said you can ask for suspension of those names but you can ask for blocking of those domain names because of the of the peculiar way the system operates and is is actually not a case of piracy crime fishai it may lead to piracy but it is not the case like it arose in utv which was a case of mirror websites primarily formed to indulge in piracy so there is a slight amount of difference and i think it may not be appropriate at this stage to push the envelope that far but really some thought needs to go into this of domain registrations how it would to take place but as long as it is machine led you really can't injunct it at this stage so just uh, one question therefore is 
Now, is there a need, uh, you know, you spoke about the freedom of the internet and you spoke about uh, freedom of expression and speech. I mean, is there a freedom of anonymity? Is there, is there a need for developing the law or developing legislation which says you cannot really establish these ghost websites, that you need to have some real uh, person behind it who can be named and who has to stand up? Does that, does that make sense? Does that solve some problem? In my view, anonymous websites is not the problem. The problem is when it is coupled with intent to infringe. When it is coupled with intent to violate court orders. I think that really is the troublesome part, not the anonymity which goes with the websites. Certain persons, because of certain reasons, may not like to give their names. And maybe for a just cause or a good cause, maybe even a charitable purpose, that someone sets up a website but doesn't want to be identified. I think that may not be appropriate. That may be really pushing it. But it has to be seen in conjunction and in the overall context. As I said, there are so many factors which can be considered. Whether you're violating court orders, not obeying, not appearing before court, and uh, setting up mirror image, uh, mirror websites. These sort of factors are crucial, but not just anonymous websites. I think that may not be per se bad. Thank you. Uh, so uh, moving on to a couple of questions actually directly on, on, on copyright. And I'll first, I like to go to the MRF Metro Tires uh, case in which the interesting concept of what truly means a uh, copy uh, in case of a cinematographic work, infringing copy. Now, uh, uh, clearly, uh, you know, uh, uh, the judgment uh, holds that uh, as, you know, if, uh, if there is material, uh, there is substantial fundamental and essential and material uh, resemblance or reproduction, then that is uh, considered to be a copy and not necessarily a physical copy, which uh, as we all know, has been the view held by, held by some. So the question I had actually was that, that there are these interesting differences in sections 14 A, B and C of the act, uh, which actually define, as we know, each type of, uh, each type of uh, work to which the copyright is to be, uh, is, is and, the, and the limits or the boundaries of those copyright. And they do tend to use different uh, language there. Uh, and the rights described are different. For example, you do have a right in the, in case of literary dramatic musical works, you have right to reproduce, perform and adapt. Uh, the question uh, that arises is that if section 14 as well, which just uses the expression of to make a copy, uh, to sell or communicate, put on commercial rent and to communicate and does not have things like adaptation, things like uh, a, 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 a couple of other things that you actually have, make any translation of the work or make any adaptation of the work. The question then would arise that would, by extension, it could be said that in when a cinematographic film actually enjoys all of those uh, rights. And just in connection with that is the next question that I had, and maybe, you know, like the version recording of uh, music. So what's your, what's your view on that? a film firstly is normally based on an original underlying work. It's an adaptation or interpretation of the original literary or dramatic work. It's like the superstructure which emerges on a foundation. At the same time, there's a creative leap, as it is called, from the page to the screen. And the film is much more than the sum of its parts. And the amount of effort that goes into making a film is enormous. 
the lighting that goes into it, the, the, the color that it is shot in, the hues that you may give, the expressions that the director obtains from his actors. It's not just that work that is there, not just the idea, the expression that goes into it. I felt is a lot more. Yes, the argument that is that is given is that in certain sections, the act uses the term reproduce, while in certain sections with regard to the film, it uses the expression copy. But I must tell you, and that's what I've stated in my judgment, that firstly, the word copy has not been defined in the act. Secondly, the dictionary meaning copy includes reproduction. Thirdly, in the Bern Convention, which India is a signature, uses both copy and reproduce. Therefore, I was of the view that there is no reason to limit the definition of the term copy to mean only physical duplicate copy. See, we must give it a purposive interpretation, whether it's an advertisement or a film. There's a lot of creativity that goes into it, which needs to be protected. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, Mr. Sagar, I recall that when I just uh, branched off on my own, uh, one of my clients was an event manager and uh, there was an issue with regard to a cricket series and we had gone to Bombay to do a matter where your firm was representing one of the Kola manufacturers. And uh, on the way to the airport, we were all in a, in a single car including some of your clients. And they told me something interesting. They said that we go to Mr. Sagar not to just to get legal advice, but at times to conclude our, uh, or finish our advertisements because he gives very good input. And in those days, there was that famous ad which had come, you know, with regard to a polar drink, Dil Mange Mor. That's right. I'm told you had a huge contribution to make to that. And imagine <laughs> after 30 years, I remember a tagline, Dil Mange Mor. Yeah. Surely you can't say that there is no creativity attached to it and it doesn't need any protection. You mm -hmm. can't place a film, in my view, at par with a joke. See, it's very interesting, like the other day we, we were discussing. Uh, copyright and jokes is very difficult to obtain and, and to get an injunction order because there's a concept known as right around. And the joke is supposed to be very short it's supposed to convey an idea. The expression is very, very small in that. Therefore, it's difficult to get an injunction in a joke. But in a film, it's all about expression. It's not the idea. Therefore, I think the creativity is much more. I felt the Calcutta High Court had taken a broader view of the matter. And in fact, I had found that even in a, uh, even a Bombay High Court in another matter had taken a different view than than what is prob probably believed to be the view of the Bombay High Court. In fact, it was very interesting. YRF, who was the plaintiff in that matter, in one of the matters, had taken the defense and succeeded in Bombay that it must mean a physical copy. And they came to Delhi to say, no, no, it's not just a physical copy. Yes, I recall <laughs> that one. <laughs> so these are interesting times, but at the same time, I felt that creativity needs to be protected. And there's a lot of creativity that goes into a film. Just consider Shole, you know, after 40, 50 years, you still remember that film for the, for the way the characters were, were defined and etched. Each character was complete in itself, although he may come for a minute or two. See, what, what thought must have gone in, how much of creativity, imagination must have gone into it, that even after 40, 50 years, we still remember those characters who appeared on the screen for a minute or two. That's the, 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 the language of the expression and the, the concept of creativity which needs to be predicted. 
So I have one, uh, therefore, interesting question which comes out of it, that if you have adaptation of a film, for example, then really the right to have that adaptation made is then with the underlying copyright owners, like the, the author who may have written the script or the play on which the, or the novel on which the film is based, or is it with the producer of the film who has the copyright in the film? Because if adaptation is not necessarily covered under section 14 D in that sense. So to, you know, who has then the rights? Would it be you adapt a film or you make a translation of a film? Uh, is it all of them they trigger in or is it just the parts of it? Interesting question, I, no? Yeah, yes, <laughs> uh, 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 yes, very interesting. Uh, yeah. uh, the jury is still out on this. <laughs> And I, in fact, I think the answer is in your, in your last sentence. That uh, is it the author? Is it the director? Is it the producer? Or you need permission from all three of them separately? It may be that someone may canvas that these are three separate works and therefore you need permission from all three of them separately. It's not just one person. Oh. Yes. That, that may also be an interesting argument to make. Yeah. And really, uh, you know, at this moment, we have two conflicting views on this issue. So uh, one is by the Copyright Board, uh, which was headed by Justin Manmohan Singh, who's, who's really one of the thinkers in copyright. And the other is by Justin Andlaw, who again is a very innovative mind. And both have written very compelling judgments this will have to be considered and uh, a view will have to be taken. So I have one last question on the technical side, so to say, and that is the role of deterrence, uh, whether it is damages or, or criminal uh, uh, sanctions uh, in terms of piracy and, uh, and infringement. Now, uh, so what, I mean, you know, we, not, we don't have a huge damages culture in this country for diverse uh, reasons. From your perspective, I mean, do you think that, you know, a stronger uh, uh, sort of focus on damages and harsher penalties will 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 work? I mean, will work as a deterrent? See, one size fits all approach may not be appropriate. It may depend from case to case. For instance. Uh, we have come across many cases as a judge where the defendant on day one, when he appears, says, yes, I have committed a mistake. I will not carry on with this activity. We pass an injunction order, decree the suit with regard to injunction. But see, I'm a very small man. I come from a village. And I was running this cable channel and I've shut down my business. I have anyway suffered losses. Don't pass any damages, and I'm willing to suffer an injunction. Most of the time, the plaintiff agrees and says, "Yes, pass a decree of injunction and be done with it." But it, but sometimes the lawyers don't agree. They say, "No, we insist on damages." The question is, there is there is no possibility of getting any damages from that gentleman at the end of the day. So, would that work as a deterrence? In a case where there is no possibility of any recovery to take place, are we just prolonging the trial in those matters? But yes, if there is a rogue website or a or a or a defendant who's who's habitually doing this, then surely some very severe damages need to be passed. For instance, in a pharmaceutical matter where I had found that. The defendant was repeatedly changing its names and repeatedly manufacturing products of different companies, which had a very high turnover. In the fourth or fifth matter, while I was decreeing the suit on injunction, I told him next time you do it, we'll pass a decree of damages of five crores against you without any evidence. And I recorded it in the judgment. I mean, named that promoter, the defendant in that matter, that next time he does it, it will be five crore against him. 
without any evidence and so on. So really, one will have to see the facts of each case. But you are right. In India, we have unfortunately not developed the jurisprudence of damages. And just see how it operates in civil law. A client who suffered damages first has to file a suit. He has to pay court fees. So the person who's out of pocket first has to deposit money in court, one person amount or whatever it may be, as fees. Then he has to engage a lawyer and he doesn't know when the suit will be resolved. So the, the damages culture has really not taken roots in India. To that extent, there is a mindset issue which is there definitely. So, it cuts both ways, yes. Actually, that gives me a segue into the next section that was on question of expeditious disposal of IP matters because the fact that, you know, people are quite happy to get an interim injunction uh, and feel happy about it and say, okay, let's just settle the matter is one of the reasons, of course, is that it takes so long for a matter to finally get decided and people have lost uh, by that time interest or they don't want to just pursue it anymore. And, you know, it kind of ends there. Now. Uh, we were all very happy when IP, got in, IP matters got included as part of commercial matters under the Commercial Courts Act. And uh, now you, I know you've been sort of, you know, judge in charge of the original site for a long time, and you've played a very pivotal role in formulation of the daily high court rules to implement the Commercial Courts uh, Act provision, so to say. Uh, we don't know, you know, want to, in terms of understanding the actual impact on the ground. So I wanted to ask you that from your perch as a judge and your experience, what are the three most, a couple of most troublesome bottlenecks that you find from your perspective, which lead to delays? And then the obverse of that coin is that if you had to suggest two or three things which can be done, to solve some of the problems, what would those be? So there's the one side of the coin and then there's the obverse of that coin. So over to you. The first problem that we were repeatedly encountering in all civil suits, not just IP matters was, service on the defendants. Certain rogue defendants would not accept service especially when the process server would go. So in the 2018 rules, we tried to liberalize the issue of service. We said you could be served by email, WhatsApp, try to bring in new concepts of service. Secondly, we brought in very strict timelines for completion of pleadings. And let me tell you, both these reforms have worked at the ground level. Today, pleadings are getting completed with admission denial of documents done within about three to six months. Nearly in about 95 person matters. So the procedural bot bottlenecks, as it were, they have got resolved to a large extent. But the mindset has to really change. The real emphasis amongst the IP laws, uh, against the IP, uh, amongst the IP lawyers is with regard to interim injunction. They don't think beyond an interim injunction at this moment. The whole fight is as it were only for the injunction and nothing beyond that. And I think that mindset will change over a process of time. They will also have to get used to the idea of, of using the new provisions that have come into force in the Commercial Courts Act. For instance, summary judgments. That's a concept which is not being used very often as it were today. I agree, it, it, it's quite fresh it to take roots over a period of time. But this is an important provision which will greatly facilitate expeditious disposal of the matters. Also, I think procedurally having written arguments to be placed on record before you start arguing, before you start hearing arguments is of great help. Most of the time you, are, you find 
that the plaintiff is able to understand the full case when he is in his rejoinder because really no one has thought through the case in the initial opening if someone puts pen to paper at the initial stage itself i think a lot of time in arguments get gets cutted the whole emphasis on having written submissions prior to hearing that culture will also have to you know take roots over a period of time we have introduced various concepts today is it's nothing novel but but it's it's something which was missing in our acts previously in our rules previously for instance the confidentiality club the hot tubbing concept as it were so new concepts have come in we trying to imbibe them and uh, we hope over a period of time things will will drastically improve uh, in in our between 2018 to 20 uh, we had made tremendous progress especially on the ipr side but this pandemic has again you know stalled that 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 improvement that was taking place and really everything has slowed down so i think we'll have to pick up things as it were after the court start physically uh, working so this is an important facet but but there's there's tremendous scope for uh, for expeditious disposal of matters and i hope it will happen in the near future Mm. But where we see, of course, the pleadings part works very well. But then the the two areas where there are then delays. One, of course, is recall of evidence, and then thereafter having the case placed for arguments. And then there are questions, of course, that how soon the judgment will come. So I think I believe that those three still remain to be surmounted. I think there is uh, some work to be done there. Uh, you know, I mean, the pleadings and all we can do under case management, which is being used quite effectively. so hopefully as you say that better days are ahead i have just one last question now left from uh, from my side and uh, you know before uh, uh, so this uh, is concerning uh, as you know last month the intellectual uh, property appellate board and the film certification appellate tribunal have been abolished so all cases which were pending before these tribunals are technically supposed to move to the high court and uh, that has kind of caused a little bit of a concern to us in the ip fraternity both the ip practitioners and ip owners that uh, a lot of the things simple things or specific things that used to get done quite quickly in uh, an ipab tribunal kind of situation typically formal objections uh, cases being rejected whether it's a trademark patent or whatever in the in in, in the ipo and you go to ipab and you quickly get a relief and you are back and you prosecute your application and you carry on with life or issues like uh, uh, section 6 of the copyright act when there are when there are disputes as to the duration of the copyright or what is copyrightable or not and you could easily go to the appla- to the ipab and and get a quick answer now all of this will get into actually the very formalistic so to say uh, procedures and systems and if i may use the word a little bit more loosely legalistic uh, thing that happens at the high court uh, we we worry that this is going to lead to delays and you know most of the ip registration prosecution matters are highly time sensitive because you have duration for which the ip may get granted for example so is there a way that uh, and it's too early i know uh, we haven't still received directions as to which high courts will have jurisdictions and so on but how would you i mean is there a way that there can be some fast tracking of sort of purely procedural matters that can be done at a fast track basis versus substantive appeals or you know so we are we are sort of looking for some guidance and some light at the end of this tunnel which looks very dark at the moment uh, let me address this issue slightly different see when i was a lawyer i used to wonder why there is tribunalization of justice and i strongly believed as a lawyer that it would have been better it would it, it would always be better if you had a specialized judge dealing with a particular jurisdiction 
say there is let me take the, the companies act dealing with the companies act say in the high court rather than having in those days the company law board see what i used to find amazing was that a matter with regard to unpaid dues of 1 lakh could go to the high court because the winding up petition had to be filed in the high court while a operation and mismanagement petition of a company which was worth about a billion rupees would go to a tribunal see the tribunal because of certain constraints whether of resources whether of independence whether of space they they really would find it difficult to deal with very important issues which are high stake in nature the court with its with all its trappings and its independence according to me is a far better body but if you are working at half the strength and there is new workload that is going to be added then things are going to be different so i don't know whether it's the appropriate time or not but the concept as a lawyer i always believed that tribunal of justice the tribunalization of justice may not be the correct answer yes these tribunals were manned by specialists very high integrity people but the as i said the infrastructure or the trappings which a court has no tribunal can have therefore you may examine it from a different perspective you are saying that for small issues you will have to come to court see if in one matter the high court judge what to pull up an administrative official saying how negligently you are handling a matter next time you do it i'll pass strictures against you i don't think you'll have to file 50 other matters which you may have to do in a in a matter filed before a tribunal you may have to come repeatedly before a tribunal for the same violation in 50 cases but if a high court judge takes a strong view and says i will ensure that next time you do this there will be an adverse entry in your acr or something to that or i will tell your superiors to keep you under watch that man will never do it again see the the perch which a high court judge enjoys is i think as a lawyer i have always felt is far better than any tribunal therefore conceptually the the courts may be a better institution but a they require specialists and i think that is the most important point people are approaching it from a different perspective the perspective they are approaching it whether it is uh, a tribunal where they can get speedy justice or uh, it's a high court which may be a general court which i think you should approach it in a slightly different way that you require a specialized judge dealing with this particular jurisdiction once you get that i think the problem will be solved and it will be far better solution than what you have at the moment it may take some time it may require some working because this work as you rightly said with regard to section 6 may not be an appellate jurisdiction work may not come to the red court it may fall into the commercial domain so all these works will have to be segregated procedurally and given to different posters but that will evolve over a period of time and i don't think that will take very long but what you need is and i think that's the point that needs emphasis you require specialized judges dealing with these special jurisdictions that will be of great thank you we have uh, uh, two of our uh, panelists here uh, anil and zameer and they had a question each of you so i know that you had to run away at 5 uh, because you were tied up it's already i can see it's already 5:12 But if you can give us two more minutes, yeah, yeah, sure. and Anil and Zamir can ask their question. Yeah. Uh, Anil, over to you, please, for your question. Thank you so much. 
Um, so my question is, uh, considering the number of litigations that we have been seeing post the 2012 amendment to the Copyright Act, uh, do you think the current law lacks clarity and that is why the reason for this litigation to happen? And uh, if so, what is the way forward that you see? See, the problem is a little more fundamental. Problem today is laws are being passed without proper debate, without involving the entire society at large. See, the civil society needs to be involved. When the act is to be brought about, there must be a larger debate. Unfortunately, that debate is not happening in our civil society. I don't blame the, the, the government for that. I, I blame the civil society for that. See, these matters need to be debated, need to be thrashed out. Each and every person must analyze the draft amendment that is going to be brought about. Everyone must give his comments and they must be seriously considered. Uh, now, just see the new acts which Mr. Jyoti Saga was just referring to. They have come by way of an ordinance. And really, uh, what has shaken the confidence of the public is that, <laughs> that they have just come overnight, you know, and they have read about it in the newspaper that this ordinance has come about. I think if there was a much larger debate and it had come about after speaking to everyone, with a little input from everyone, uh, surely the impact would have been very, very different and and people would have understood what the emphasis is and why they are saying that tribunalization of justice may not be a good idea. I think it's a, it's a very important debate which must take place. But that debate must take place prior to the act coming into force or the amendment coming into force. So anyway, this is, this is yet to be passed by parliament. I'm sure there'll be a debate and the civil society must debate and must convey its views to the parliamentarians and they must take it into account. I think that will greatly facilitate things. Yes, as I said, the scientific and technological advances which are taking place, that itself is a ground to have a good relook at the Copyright Act. And especially when you are, you are moving away from old concepts. The old concept was that the producer of the film has all the rights. And you're moving away from that, there'll be a certain amount of resistance because the whole concept is getting shattered as it were. So these are interesting times, but I'm sure law will evolve and people will understand why an amendment was brought about, what is the intent of this amendment and how it can be harmonized and what are the various options that are available to harmonize this amendment. It's not just one way of looking at it. It's not A versus B. It may be the law has rights in both A and B, and someone has to take rights from both A and B. So, and how will that proportionate, or how, what will be the proportion of, or disbursement of the, of the fees, the royalty, that, that's also an important issue that will have to be decided. So these are vexed issues, but these are new concepts which need to, uh, uh, which need to take root, and they will take root over a period of time. Thank you. So, Zami, uh, uh, yeah. your turn now, please. Right, right. Uh, just as Manmohan, uh, uh, it's a privilege and honor uh, to be in front of you, either before the court or every forum. It's really a privilege. Uh, my question is uh, that, you know, considering that the royalty amendment uh, in the copyright was brought in 2012, uh, are there any ambiguities in the interpretation of the law? with respect to the issues or uh, issue of royalty payable to the performers, like singers, actors, choreographers under the amendment, amended copyright law. I know there are two conflicting judgments. Uh, your reflections, uh, because there is two conflicting judgments mean, also means that there are different interpretation on, on the legislative intent. Your views on the same. Uh, uh, I will not get into the specifics of it because one doesn't know and one has to deal with some issue on this aspect. But you're right. Uh, just see, uh, the Copyright Board has taken an entirely different view from what a learned single judge of the court has taken. And they are just a day apart, those two yeah. opinions. So surely there is weight in both the opinions and they'll have to be considered. And 
as I said, this is a new concept. This is the legislature has also pushed the envelope. Uh, it will have to be examined. And uh, uh, these are interesting times for a lawyer on the copyright side. And uh, a lawyer should never grudge when two opinions are plausible. No, <laughs> they should they should welcome them. And uh, that's how the law will evolve over a period of time. And it'll be interesting how how it goes. Maybe good for the entire society. Thank you, just. Thank you. Uh, so, friends, uh, uh, as J Justice Manmohan indicated, he'll be now leaving us. So, on behalf of all of us, I want to thank you, sir, for uh, spending time with us this afternoon. And it was uh, wonderful uh, having a conversation with you and uh, and hearing your most uh, wonderful and always thought-provoking and thoughtful uh, thoughtful opinions and views. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you once again for showing the patience. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, uh, Kavita, so I'll hand it over to you, please, now, for carrying on with the program. Thank you, Jyoti. I would like to introduce our panel moderator, Rajendra Kumar, who is popularly known as RK. RK has extensive experience of nearly 37 years in handling all aspects of prosecution and enforcement of IPR. IPR is, uh, uh, sorry. RK is one of the founding partners of the firm and is counsel and senior advisor at KNS Partners. RK chairs the trademark practice of the firm and also heads the litigation practice in respect of trademarks, copyrights, and geographical indications at the firm. Requesting uh, RK uh, to please introduce our esteemed panelists. Over to you, RK. Yeah. A very warm welcome. Uh to all the panelists. Uh, and uh, it's uh, my pleasure uh, introducing the panelists. Uh, so before I begin, uh, I would like to just outline um, the way uh, the, the um, next uh, uh, session will take shape. I divided up uh, the part into three uh, segments. Uh, one segment um, dealing with the royalty regime post 2012 amendments. Uh, the second uh, segment um, dealing with enforcement of copyright to deal with online piracy in India and the issue of secondary liability. And the third piece being administration of uh, copyright societies. Uh, let me start uh, with Lohita Sujit. Lohita Sujit uh, is uh, a se senior director Copyright and Digital Economy at Motion Picture Association India, uh, which represents Disney, Netflix, Warner Brothers, NBC, Universal, Viacom, and Sony Pictures. Uh, she has uh, contributed to various uh, IP initiatives, including the launch of the Maharashtra Digital Crime Unit to combat infringement. And uh, she has been recognized by the World IP Form as an innovative IP lawyer. Uh, to start with Lohita, uh, my question is, how can IP, intellectual property, play a significant role in the growth of creative industries? How can the uh, m, m &E sector, that is media and entertainment sector, help promote India's creative and cultural industries across the world? Over to you, uh, Sorry, I was on mute. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, am I audible now, Rajinder Ji? Yes, yes, you are. Yeah. Uh, good evening once again. Uh, thank you uh, to KNS Partners, Lex Witness, Producers Guild uh, for supporting the seminar, and hello to all my co-panelists. Uh, the discussions earlier really were very interesting, but I wanted to really touch upon uh, the value of what this industry brings. Um, I think during the pandemic, the media and entertainment sector has truly been resilient and we've, most of our segments have gone digital. And uh, as a sector, we will, in a socially distanced world, continue to be the force behind providing not only knowledge and information, but also entertainment. Uh, I remember... Uh, 
uh, you know, it was quoted earlier that copyright is the queen of IP. And I think the media and entertainment industry is very exemplary of this. Uh, in a Deloitte MPA report, uh, we actually found out that the gross output of this industry was 349,000 crore rupees. And uh, this industry supports 26.6 lakh jobs. Uh, in, in 2018, this industry was recognized as a champion service sector among 11 other sectors. And uh, if this industry today, from a policy point of view, from a you know, copyright law point of view, is given the right impetus, it really has the potential of supporting at least 1.1 million jobs and add at least 233,000 crores of total gross output to the economy in the next five years. Um, so to your point, Rajendraji, you know, this only goes to prove that our industry uh, not only entertains and creates employment opportunities, but we also promote India's creative and cultural industries across the world. So in my opinion, giving privacy to copyright becomes imperative. There is no better time than now to look overlook, I mean, to oversee what's really happening in, in our world, uh, to look at relevant amendments in the law. And uh, this is very apt, especially when India has been consistently improving in its ranking on the WIPO Global Innovation Index. Uh, we've grown uh, to the 48th position in 2020 from the 52nd position in 2020. Thank you, uh, thank you, um, uh, Navita. Now, continuing uh, uh, with the same stream, uh, may I now turn to uh, Zameer Nakhani, uh, and let me introduce uh, Zameer Nakhani. Uh, Mr. Zameer uh, Nakhani is Senior uh, Vice President and General Counsel at UFO Movies, and he has had a very distinguished career. Uh, his previous assignments uh, include Associate VP uh, Reliance Entertainment, uh, he also uh, uh, worked uh, as head legal, uh, biology telefilms, then director legal, Raymond. And he has uh, uh, an enviable list of uh, degrees to his credit. Uh, uh, Harvard Business School, Executive MBA, and MIS, US IP Laws. Uh, so uh, there cannot be uh, any expert better than Mr. Nathani uh, to uh, Field uh, my my next question, uh, yeah, Mr. Nathani, uh, as you were involved in the deliberations among the relevant stakeholders, leading to the enactment of the royalty provisions in the Copyright Amendment Act of 2012, could you please briefly explain the thought processes uh, underlying these deliberations, and in particular, why the theatrical exploitation was kept exempt from payment of royalty? Over to you, Zamir. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And uh, thanks to Lex Witness and all the sponsors. Uh, see, the idea behind uh, having exemption for the theatrical uh, part of it, uh, the background to it is that, uh, you know, there were some facts and figures which were put in place. The producer guild met up uh, at JW Merritt, and then we had a, a representation which was also made to people who had initiated this particular law. And then we had, of course, meetings with the then uh, copyright and patent registrar, uh, Mr. Agwender, and uh, it proceeded on those lines, number one. Number two is that the discussion points which were put forward uh, before the government when the uh, amendment was under consideration and how why theater should be exempted from uh, payment of royalty as an exploiter. Uh, the facts of the case was that there are about 44 movies. This may not be, people might not be aware on this uh, webinar that these are the quantum of movies which release every week. So uh, there are about 44 movies which release in India per week. So we may be hearing about one or two movies, hit movies coming, but there are overall 44 movies which release per week. Of course, during the pandemic, it has been a different scenario. I'm talking about a general situation. It's Hindi, Telugu, Tamil, Malayalam, Bhojpuri, etc. Uh, which makes to about 140 movies per month. And that's about 1,000 movies per annum. All right. Uh, this is one of the statements which was also said by uh, Mr. Akshay Kumar at one of the shows. That these are the quantums of movies. Now, out of 1,500 movies which are made per annum, only 20 to 25 movies per annum are blockbusters. All right. So blockbuster means that super duper normal profit, etc. 
like your salman khan movies etc more than about 60% of the movies make losses and balanced movies are just able to garner their cost and some profit so these are in terms of the numbers now in this scenario if a theater owner is made to pay a royalty as exploiter in addition to the entertainment tax property taxes considering the cost of running a theater in india real estate cost maintenance of property etc staff etc uh running a theater is a difficult business to operate uh one example which i can give you in the real time even today uh is that if you now want to open a theater after the pandemic uh, during which the theaters were shut down to reopen a theater it takes about 2 to 5 lakhs per theater now if you are a theater chain with about 800 theaters in india it requires about 40 crores to just reopen your theaters clean up check electrical wiring air conditioner overhauling etc before earning a single rupee now in this scenario if cost of royalty was imposed on theaters then theaters would have been non existent that was the argument which was put forward before the government at that point of time considering the cost matrix which were involved all right now pandemic is a added value to it uh and you know as rightly said by all the film stars movies are made for the theaters or big screen and i think therefore the government in its wisdom uh, rightly decided to exempt theaters from royalty payment on exploitation of the content in cinemas uh, that's my uh, small and sweet submission thank you yeah Th- thank you sumi <clears throat> uh, may now turn to anil uh, anil lale uh and uh, anil lale uh, also has uh, a very distinguished uh, career he uh, has been um, a media and uh, entertainment lawyer with more than 17 years of experience he has been a uh, g- general counsel of viacom 18 uh, india cast international uh, where he manages contracts litigation ip protection uh, and previously he worked uh, as a group general counsel for c group Uh, and he was instrumental in setting up Z's music business and managing all legal aspects of its print, television, and online news media businesses. Uh, my question uh, to Anil uh, is: uh, as a person intimately involved in the M&A, M&E sector in India, and uh, your experience uh, as a media and technology lawyer is proof of that. Uh, what do you see the biggest hurdle in in effective collection of royalties under the copyright amendment act of 2012 over to you anil thank you very much thank you everyone thank you lex witness for this opportunity um in my view the biggest hurdle is the same act which is supposed to enable uh, the collection of royalties itself is posing as the biggest hurdle in collection of royalties and we can we have been seeing since 2012 the industry is grappling with different interpretations of the provisions under the act and this has led to various litigation and diametric completely diametric views taken by different forums instead of for example instead of uh, providing for a clean system of attributing an economic right to authors of literary and musical works the act has mixed the economic right of royalty with the ownership of us or ownership and assignment why I say why i say this is because the right of royalty is covered under section 18 which is transfer of ownership through assignment of copyright the provisos under section 18 uh, relating to royalty which has been inserted by the 2012 amendment provided for an economic right this was an inalienable right then that the author can only assign to the uh, to uh, his or her legal heirs or to a copyright society that's the collection of royalty and it's a pure economic right which survives post parting with the ownership of the um, the um, uh, of the work itself however if you look at section 199 or 1910 of the copyright act this uh, the you know apart from the right economic right of royalty there is also mention of a claim of an equal share of not only royalties but also consideration payable in case of utilization of the work however there is no clarity as to what this consideration means as an author who has parted with ownership of the work cannot seek part of the license fee over and above the ro- royalties under section 18 now that is one lack of clarity 
Also, the 2012 amendment could not bring an end to the old age debate that started with the Supreme Court judgment in IPRS versus Eastern Indian uh, motion pictures matter regarding whether a literary and musical work underlying a sound recording is to be separately licensed for the purpose of communication to public of the sound recording. That is when a sound recording is played in public, do you need to get the license from the IPRS or, or, or from the authors of the literary and musical works? This debate should have ended with a, when a separate economic right to royalty has been prescribed under the Amendment Act. However, uh, uh, you know, this uh, still continues and a classic example of this is the views taken by IPAB in the Music Broadcast Limited case and the Delhi High Court in the IPRS versus Entertainment Network matter. Now, um, that is one part. And uh, coming to the uh, Great Indian Road Trip, uh, uh, road trick, as I call it, uh, under the Copyright Act. If you look at Section 198, which was introduced again under 2012 Amendment, it says that any um, you know assignment of copyright in any work, contrary to the terms or, and conditions of the rights already assigned to a copyright society in which the author of the work um, is a member, will be invalid, is, is void, basically. So if the copyright, um, uh, basically the uh, author um, is a member of a uh, society and under his membership, um, um, he has assigned the work to the society, which is happening today, because if you look at IPRS and its membership, uh, uh, if you go to the website, we'll see assignment agreements executed by all others in favor of IPRS, which basically assigns all the uh, ownership in the future works or the works that's being created by the authors uh, to IPRS. However, at the same time, if you'll see music composers and lyricists are entering into agreements, assigning such rights to the music uh, labels and producers as well. Now, um, the question that is going to happen, uh, of the, the debate that is going to happen later on is that uh, who is actually the owner of those works? Who is the assignee of those works? And if that debate happens, because um, um, whoever is, is, is assigned those works is going to be the assignee of the work. And under section 18, the right of royalty or the royalty itself is to be equally split between the author and the assignee. Now, whether this assignee is going to be the copyright society or the, whether the assignee is going to be the producer is going to be a bigger debate. And if in this debate it is determined that IPRS is going to be the assignee of the work, that is, means the owner of the work, then the next question that arises is who will get the e equal share of royalty along with the author? Whether it's going to be the society who uh, is not, uh, who is supposed to be a, uh, a collection agency and not a uh, owner of the work per se, and or uh, is it going to be the producer at whose instance the work is going to be produced and an assignment, specific assignment is taken by the producer. Let's say section, uh, the proviso to section 17, also which has been introduced. Um, um, there is a, a, a debate around that also, but say, let's say that that does not as, um, automatically assign the ownership of the work uh, to the producer, but through assignment, even if the producer takes that work, will he become the assignee? So this kind of uh, confusions that is being created under section 19, 18, and 17 is uh, really uh, standing in the way of collection of royalties because the debate continues. Uh, there is no clarity as to who will uh, collect from uh, whom and how much is to be collected. So I think this debate itself is the uh, biggest challenge in collection of royalties. Person. Thanks, Anil. I think uh, you have very correctly uh, outlined the legal quagmire surrounding uh, licensing of uh, copyright in India and especially in the context of uh, collection of royalties. Uh, and uh, uh, my, my colleague uh, Prashant Gupta is also uh, on the panel. Uh, Prashant is uh, a partner in the litigation team at uh, KNS Partners and he has been uh, involved in and uh, personally uh, uh, instrumental in some of the leading judgments uh, delivered by Delhi High Court, including the MySpace judgment, which I had the pleasure of arguing for MySpace. Uh, so I, I would uh, uh, request Prashant to uh, outline the legal quagmire surrounding licensing of copyright in India uh, from his perspective as a copyright lawyer. Thank you, Arthi, and uh, thank you. Next with this for organizing this uh, this webinar. Now, uh, 
The licensing issues and royalty issues have been, my co-panelists have, have talked about it. I would not like to kind of repeat it about it in the interest of time. Uh, so definitely there are a lot of ambiguities in section 17, 18, and 19, and uh, so on and so forth. Now the two judgments which have been referred by Honorable Justice and my co-panelist, including IPR Entertainment by the Daily High Court and Music Broadcast uh, Limited versus Tip Industries. Uh, I will quickly touch upon these two judgments. And, uh, you know, and, and as Justice uh, Manmohan rightly pointed out, both of them have been written, the judgments have been written by uh, people with distinguished, or judges with distinguished background uh, on laws, including Justice Manmohan Singh, who has been an IP lawyer throughout, and Justice Endlaw, who has written many path breaking judgments on IP issues. Now, uh, coming to the judgment of IPAB, written by Justice Manmohan Singh in uh, uh, Music Broadcast Limited versus Tip Industries. Uh, the difficulty has been that both the judgments refers to the 1977 judgment of IPRS versus Eastern India Motion Pictures and also the 2012 amendments and the 2011 judgment of, uh, uh, again, IPRS versus uh, Aditya Pandey. Now, all these judgments and uh, pre-2012 amendments uh, Supreme Court kind of, in a way, settled the issue, uh, but right at the time when the 2012 amendment came, and perhaps there could be no more ambiguous act than the 2012 amendments. Now, just this, uh, Manmohan Singh in the in, uh, in Music Broadcast Limited versus Tip Industries held that the sound recording and underlying works are, are work of shade right. And he referred to provisional section 1718, where it talks about uh, the authors of underlying work uh, cannot waive off their right to assignment in the, in the they, they cannot waive the uh, right uh, uh, to assign copyright in work. And also that these authors are entitled to equal royalties. Uh, difficulty arose when after a few days, Justice Endlo passed another judgment stating that utilization of underlying works in sound recording, once it is utilized, then no further authorization is required from the authors of underlying works. He also talked about the fact that a sound recording is a work of joint authorship. He referred to 2012 amendments and according to his interpretation, 2012 amendment did not change anything. And he indicated that once you have taken license from the sound from the producer of sound recording, you do not require any further license from the underlying works. Now, I will not want to go into the debate as to which of the judgments is correct. But as a fundamental question, which as lawyer, in all my years of experience, I found it difficult is clarity of law. There's no clarity, neither for the producers, nor for the authors, nor for radio broadcasters who intend to use this. And this lack of clarity is actually creating the problem. And where is this lack of clarity coming from? It's actually flowing from the act itself. Now, Justice Manmohan uh, very rightly mentioned that these issues have to be debated before it put, that they are, are incorporated in the act. Even when they are debated, the way they are incorporated into the act may not reflect the clear, clear discussion. So I think it's time, and according to me, of course, we could have judgments to uh, clear the issues. They, we, it will go up to the Supreme Court. And I understand, uh, I, I can clearly make out Justice Manmohan's uh, reluctance in offering any kind of suggestion was because at least one of the judgment is before him under appeal. So he clearly didn't want to make any reference to, to the interpretation of the, of the two judgments or the rightness of the two judgments. But the, the fact is that it may go to the Supreme Court and we'll have another precedent and it'll, the lack of clarity will continue. I think it's time that the act has to be amended. There has to be clear clarity in the act. And until we have clarity, these disputes will continue and this ambiguity will not end. I think the act is so ambiguous as Anil clearly pointed out that it has to be amended. That's the way forward for it to be. <coughs> Yeah, thanks, uh, Prashant. Uh, let me uh, quickly move to the next part, um, 
of, of our discussion uh, because uh, we have uh, uh, the pressure of time. Uh, this one uh, would be looking at enforcement of copyright to de deal with online piracy in India. And uh, my first question goes to uh, Lohita. Uh, my question is um, the copyright amendments of 2012 uh, int introduced certain intermediary liability harbors in section 52.1b and C. Uh, what are your views on these new provisions and the existing secondary liability regime for such intermediaries? Is there some need for more clarity to deal with the online piracy through these platforms? Over to you. Uh, so the move actually from analog to digital services that's pretty much happened in the last seven or eight years, right? This has resulted in a plethora of commercial service providers that today have become very important for consuming content online, right? These providers could be search engines, domain name providers, hosting providers, uh, you know, also content delivery networks, right? And not to mention cloud storage providers. Now, when, when these providers are the intermediaries, and there are also providers that are responsible for, uh, you know, relaying internet to the person's device. Uh, it's quite possible that in this process, copyright is infringed, whether it's inadvertently or, you know, with the knowledge, it's very difficult to kind of point a finger at it. Um, another aspect of that particular provision in law is that uh, there is no incentive for anybody to take any action immediately, uh, because it, it, gives 36 hours for, uh, you know, uh, bringing down the content and uh, further uh, only, uh, you know, after 21 days subject to a court order, you can then refrain the content from being on a particular site. So we definitely need clarity, one on whether there is a secondary liability if, if such uh, service providers do have knowledge of such infringement. And two, if there is anything that the law can, you know, as it's getting amended, uh, you know, if that can support producers and content owners uh, in terms of at least reducing that time period because uh, in a digital world uh, a new program is releasing practically every day if not every Friday so uh, that's my view on that yeah. <clears throat> thank you Lohita uh, in the context of secondary liability uh, I will request uh, Prashant uh, just to highlight uh, uh, if if, if um, they're, they're, what is the current uh, uh, intermediary liability regime uh, so that uh, one could understand the implications for, uh, for such liability under the Copyright Act and the uh, IT Act uh, and uh, the newly uh, enacted intermediary and media rules of uh, 2021. Yeah, Prashant, yeah. Uh, the law as far as intermediary liability is concerned in a way got settled in the MySpace judgment and in uh, thereafter this was followed by almost all the courts across the country. Now the MySpace judgment did look into the aspect of internet, you know, digitalization and digital economy before coming to this uh, the conclusion. And it did recognize that uh, too much too much restriction on social media and websites perhaps could, could mean a death knell for, for them or perhaps for the internet as a whole. So there has to be a balance between uh, copyright owners as well as the rights of the copyright owners as well as the intermediaries. Uh, my space judgment did point out that uh, there has to be some harmonization uh, between the Copyright Act as well as the intermediary uh, liability under this under section 79 of the Intermediary Act. Oh, sorry, and of the IT Act. As per the current current uh, position of law. As per the current position of law, uh, intermediaries are not liable. Till intermediaries are not liable if they act expeditiously upon receiving a takedown notice from the content owner. And uh, content owners have to inform the intermediary of uh, the particular URL where the content is sitting. Uh, this, is, this is broadly what has kind of uh, become the norm now that uh, intermediary will expeditiously take it down. Uh, take but, down the uh, but the law, according to the law, the expediting, I think that's where the problem lies, right? Does that yeah. expediting, I mean, we all know when there are commercial arrangements, even with uh, a platform like YouTube, I think the norm is between seven to 10 minutes. So it's, it's, I think, very important for the law now to really reflect what the digital, uh, you know, copyright owners need. 
absolutely i mean as expeditiously uh, you know under the old intermediary guidelines were 30 days you know you have to be informed they have to reduce it to 36 days uh, 36 hours that content and as lohita pointed out that 36 hours is not sufficient uh, as per the industry standards uh, of course the law will evolve with time these are rules and rules are not act they will change very quickly they also change with times and i am sure uh, that uh, the government will look into these consideration and as far as uh, the good part is that lot of lot of time a lot of the intermediary wanted to argue that uh, as per the shreya single judgment it is the actual knowledge which we, which has to receive from the court uh, for intermediary to uh, to act upon thankfully the myspace judgment did clarify that as far as copyright infringement is concerned uh, there is no need for a court order an intermediary has to act upon immediately upon receiving the notice uh, so that that is a clarification which did come across in the myspace judgment subsequently uh, these recognitions have been recognized under the intermediary guidelines of 2021 which have recently come and uh, they also clarify that the court order is required only on certain aspects copyright doesn't fall within those aspects so that is the intermediary uh, liability regime in india <clears throat> yeah thanks uh, i will quickly uh, move to uh, zameer uh, uh, related to enforcement uh, is there any specific uh, case on copyright infringement and protection uh, that you would like to talk, talk about uh, we are obviously running short on time but uh, maybe i think you could just um, elaborate uh, the, this specific case I think, I think I'll just reflect on two judgments which came up during my career at Balaji Telefilms. I think because those will people will be able to relate because they are great examples. Uh, you know, one case which I faced was about the movie which was produced by Ekta Kapoor, known as uh, Dirty Picture, and we are all aware that Vidya Balan received national award, but the movie kept the legal team on the toes for various litigations. Uh, uh two cases on copyright which i faced uh, in context of the movie dirty picture one was uh, a landmark judgment by the bombay high court uh, uh one kannada producer wanted to make this movie and we filed for a suit for permanent injunction before the bombay high court and the hearing came up before uh, justice kathawala uh what situation we faced in this case was that uh that you know we wanted to injunct the name dirty picture we had not seen the movie by that time because the producer was not very forthcoming uh we had defenses like there are movies of don amita bachchan uh, sharukh khan nagarjuna uh we only had a judgment of movie shole which had become a brand name etc uh but it was about 40 year old movie and you know this was a 2 year old movie at that point of time when the matter came up uh we took a different strategy in this particular case uh what we did is that we portrayed dirty picture as a brand name and we produced lot of materials on record including some business magazines which said that you know dirty picture has now become a brand name of balaji telefilms and ekta kapoor uh we cited some judgments of uh, uh good cases like mercedes benz uh, uh against a garment manufacturer uh you know all those arguments were accepted and we got a judgment landmark judgment after shole on the movie dirty picture where the judgment says that dirty picture is now a comp- exclusive brand name of balaji telefilms and ekta kapoor that was one thing which came up the second uh, many of you might not be aware that the famous song of dirty picture o lala uh, was also uh, sued by sare gama in calcutta high court in kolkata high court Uh, we produced uh, certificates from mr bappi lehri who was the singer of this song uh, and uh, from shankar madevan and the case was that ulala song was a copy of a song known as ui amma and both songs were sung by uh, mr bappi lehri mr bappi lehri and shankar madevan both gave us certificate saying that you know the string is different the musical work is different the notation is different uh but the calcutta high court said that you know i mean we find it prima facie a case of infringement and asked us to deposit about 2 crores uh we filed an appeal before the uh, bench of two judges and the appeal court said it's very difficult to express an opinion at that stage 
and we got the uh, amount reduced to about 50 lakhs to deposit. I think those are the two cases which came up the, during my career in Balaji. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Zami. Uh, Anil, um, yeah, uh, how effective are the current uh, enforcement mechanisms in India uh, tackling piracy? So, um, in, you know, it is first of all, it is time we acknowledge the fact that piracy is much more than infringement. Piracy is the business of infringement. And it, it is not the kind of isolated cases that we are discussing here uh, till now, uh, wherein, you know, um, uh, one track or one uh, uh, movie or one uh, uh, you know dialogue or one title is getting infringed. Yeah, we are talking about wide, widespread infringement where um, websites and apps are predominantly um, launched to peddle with in, peddle infringement content, infringed content. This is hurting the creative economy today, and it's actually become a parallel economy to the creative, the genuine, uh, uh, you know, uh, creative economy, and it is bleeding the creative economy. Uh, uh, you know, um, because even when a movie is released, there are there have been instances even before the movie is released, the uh, torrent sites already have the copy. Maybe it's leaked from the uh, from the uh, from where it is being processed, or on the first day. Uh, uh, maybe it's uh, released in uh, in Middle East before India, then before it hits Indian uh, theaters, it is uh, released by torrent websites. So it is actually, uh, it, you know, so, something like that happens most, uh, uh, a lot of uh, money that is actually uh, uh, should come to the producer um, or the studio um, goes to the uh, pirate uh, or, you know, by way of um, advertisements that they serve or, uh, you know, other things that they, uh, they, they do uh, through the infringing websites. And uh, apart from that, um, uh, the problem that we face in tackling these websites is that there is no face for a pirate. I mean, if it is a genuine uh, player, then there is a face, there's a company, there is someone responsible. Here there is no face and there are no territorial boundaries. So our laws, the arm of our law, even though it is long, it is not long enough to reach these pirates. So the enforcement mechanism are restricted to the local or the national boundaries. And it's a mammoth job if to uh, actually reach into another country's jurisdiction and bring the pirate to justice, because it is absolutely, the cost is absolutely prohibitive. And most of the time what happens is that uh, a IP owner, because of this prohibitive cost and the uh, long fight, uh, do not take up this fight. If it is just one individual, let's say, uh, when I talk about individual, even corporates, even with Viacom 18 also, we, uh, uh, if we have to look at each and every torrent website that uh, is in different companies and safe harbors, uh, which are sitting outside India and try to bring those pirates to justice. It's not a fight even a corporate can take up. There has been uh, good private public partnerships in the model of MCDCU, Maharashtra Cyber Digital Crime Unit, um, set up to fight piracy. And it has helped to a certain extent but in uh, blocking many sites, uh, ISPs uh, block many sites. It's not just the links that is being taken down, but the site itself uh, it gets blocked after a point of time if it is found to be a predominantly infringing pirate website. Uh, <clears throat> but again, as a state agency, it has its own jurisdiction limitations. The only effective way right now, uh, as Justice Manmohan also uh, uh, touched upon, are dynamic injunctions and uh, erstwhile John Doe orders that we used to receive, uh, uh, directing the uh, ISPs to block the pirate websites and services. However, this is also treating the symptom because it is not actually bringing the stopping the pirate in, in, in his tracks. Uh, he just comes back with a variant. Let's say we go and uh, stop one website uh, uh, called kickastorrents.com. Uh, tomorrow you will see kickastorrents.tg or uh, uh, 123kickastorrents.com. Kick kick so it is, it is a continuous uh, fight that uh, each of this uh, uh, content IP owners have to do. And as corporates, we are still able to sustain that fight. But what happens to individual um, you know, IP owners? Uh, who is not represented by a corporate wherewithal, uh, with the wherewithal to fight, uh, you, know, cr you know, create a fight like this. And um, on the way forward, uh, my view is that, uh, you know, like MCDCU has been set up by a, a public-private partnership where you know, by committing, uh, you know, uh, star or, or, and all is involved uh, along with the Maharashtra police. Uh, like that, I can't, you know, it is time that, um, uh, a public-private partnership is thought through as a central nodal agency as well. As in, it, it should at least have the jurisdiction across India at least. And also, uh, uh, we need uh, such an agency 
um, to have a cooperation between nations as well. Because unless and until that is brought in, uh, that uh, cooperation between the nations is brought in, uh, it is going to be difficult to um, actually treat the, or, or um, uh, strike at the disease itself. And we'll keep on uh, treating the symptom, uh, which is by blocking the sites and taking such interim measures. Uh, that's my view on this. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I hope uh, uh, Lex Witness uh, might uh, give me five minutes of uh, indulgence because uh, this is uh, the last piece uh, administration of copyright societies in India. And uh, I believe um, uh, some of you on this panel might have uh, uh, a few views on how copyright societies in India have been administered. Uh, so, so Anil, uh, do you have uh, views on this? Uh, the Corporate Administration Societies, uh, uh, presently, first of all, uh, which all societies, uh, you know, th there has been a lot of debate about uh, uh, what kind of works uh, can actually attract royalty, like performer society, uh, uh, you know, for, for the performer's rights, whether there is a royalty or not, and all those questions is still yet to be answered. And on the, uh, so there are multiple societies are also that is being formed uh, without clarity as to uh, how and um, uh, how the you know the collection can be done by these societies, and uh, uh, present society, the uh, voting society which is IPRS main a society that is there also. Uh, you know they have been doing uh, a good job in uh, uh, administering uh, the rights of their uh, uh, the authors uh, and even producers. But uh, I think there is a lot of transparency and all those things which are under works right now, which is yet to see the light, um, which I think is important for that. Uh, clear administration of the society, including um, the setting of the tariffs and uh, uh, the finalization of the tariffs um, by discussing with all the stakeholders. All those things, uh, I think, are important in uh, streamlining the administration of societies, in my view. Yeah. Zameen, uh, what are your views? You're on mute. Sorry, can you just repeat the question? Yeah, uh, the same thing uh, with regard to administration of copyright societies in India. Uh, Anil has shared his views, so I thought you might also have your own views from uh, the perspective of content owners. Uh, I think generally, if you ask me on the copyright societies, uh, they work well, they've administered well. We have seen one of the music level uh, label also recently being tying up the uh, with the copyright society. I think from an administration perspective, uh, they've been good. Uh, certain recognitions which are pending, like there are some controversies which come on and often between them. I think if that society is completely adopted uh, as a single society, you know, not being a multiple society, that would make a lot of difference uh, on a long-term basis. This is from the past experience. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I know there is a lot uh... Uh, still uncovered, uh, and I think uh, we have exceeded uh, our uh, uh, our time by 15 minutes. Uh, so I think uh, if uh, there are any specific questions um, which need to be answered by any of the panelists, uh, uh, Rajendra, sir, uh, we have a few questions in the Q and A box. But before that, I'd like to take a live question, if you permit me. Right. Thank you, sir. Mr. Sanjay Tandon, uh, can you please unmute yourself and ask your question live? Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Sir, please go ahead. Great. Hi to everyone. Long, long time. Good to see all of you in this pandemic, still smiling. So that's good of you. And uh, we definitely, I have full uh, uh, confidence that we all will emerge better. And that's where exactly I view the 2012 amendments also, that they have acted really as a reset button as far as Copyright Act vis-a-vis -vis artists are concerned. As of course, all of you know that I was earlier with IPRS to set up the IPRS. Now I am heading the, uh, the so-called Indian Singers Rights Association, the ISRA that is now looking for the new right of the performers, which is again a cause of a lot of concern and uh, <clears throat> everything about in the industry. But I would like to uh, sort of, you know, pose this question as always I would like to understand is that one is the aspect of the law and that is what 
how uh, the honorable uh, judge manmohan ji rightly said that there is we have all seen with the 2012 amendments a marked shift happening from the way the rights and the benefits of the rights were conceived by conceived to by the law so if we have seen that of course it's going to take time for things to really settle down don't you as a panel think that there should be a more wider discussion on this subject within the industry first rather than with the government and with the law makers because after all what is law law is something put in writing of things that exist in society about the good and bad the do's and don'ts so it's won't you think that is high time that the industry should to put uh, should sit together there is nothing that we need to reinvent the wheel first of all things are happening in the west things are happening everywhere in the world we just have to tailor make it to our own condition i also would like to also say and then therefore ask that first of all this aspect about copyright society being owners of rights is what i think the law has really really missed the mark the businessmen are the ones who should be the owners and let me put it on record and i can be stated uh, uh, on this is that the artists are the worst businessmen so i for the for the one always view the aspect that business should be left to the businessman however which i think all of you all the legal people sitting here across as well as the judiciary and the legislative always feel that at the end of the day whatever said and done the artist should be receiving something which is called royalty and royalty is not something which is a huge amount royalty is a small portion of what a person makes and therefore it is the need of the hour don't you think that the industry should get into this see the law does not say how much has to be charged because that is a matter of demand and supply that is a matter of business again the businessmen need to decide and therefore don't the panel feel that there should be a whole hearted concrete and a comprehensive discussion on this subject within the industry so that then the government also is given Uh, you know a good paper a white paper on the aspect that this is the way in which the industry feels that it will flourish because everyone has to flourish it's not only the artist or the producer or the music label or the broadcaster that is one person should be flourishing no that needs to stop that is what perhaps the 2012 amendment has literally raked up i am happy to see that after the 2012 amendment the copyright word itself is now fully spelled as c o p y r i g h t earlier hum sab kehte the india mein copyright hai magar kya hai yaar kuch nahi hai it is just a c and c you know a lot of other things also so i am happy with the 2012 amendments so kindly please uh, give your thoughts on what i just asked don't you think it's a good idea that the industry spearheaded by all of you y'all can uh, sort of uh, initiate that as well mpa can do that as well uh, so can we do such a thing and then take this further what's your opinion on what's your thoughts on yeah i think mr nathami uh, you would be the ideal person to answer this and if yeah, uh, yeah. so sanjay uh, number 1 i know you are a crusader number 2 uh, Uh, there were a lot of deliberations, Sanjay. You, frankly speaking, I was part of many of those meetings, whether it is singers, Sonu Nigam, etc. Meeting which happened. Uh, uh, all those meetings, most of the meetings, I was part of it. Based on those representations, were made to the uh, government, etc. So there were multiple uh, deliberations which happened on that subject during that point of time. Uh, number three, even after the law was passed, uh, there were contracts which were signed, which said about the royalty portion we tried bringing i mean the company music companies tried bringing out different models uh, from the law perspective etc a lot of things happened uh, royalty rate was not decided under the law and we all knew it would take little point of time because you know to bring together the industry together itself is the first stage and then the second stage would be having a deliberations beyond that so i think at that point of time also there were a, a deliberation which happened at all levels it's that that it 
the law culminated i mean the call law has culminated because of those deliberations only the only point is the law is stuck in the interpretation of something because certain rights about musician etc has been already decided it's just the performers right in terms of the actors singers etc choreographers which remains pending and the rate at which royalty is paid uh, if something is to be done for and on behalf of the industry we are all in fact together the point is some dynamics will have to see through it like for example when i gave you some facts about the cinema industry theater industry there are some facts and figures which were considered by the government and therefore theaters were not considered as an exploitation uh, uh, as an exploiter because there was a reason for it because otherwise the industry will shut down even comparatively if you see the industry in india uh the number of theaters we have got is about what 8000 12000 versus 70000 in china so you know even comparative wise there was a vast difference in those numbers so i think deliberations number one to just conclude deliberations extensively happened because i was there in uh, most of the meetings number two representations were made on that and therefore the law got culminated number three theaters were exempted because of the representations any new movement we are always there to support on that part but some some f- balance will have to be made between all the industry because every movie is not about 100 crore that's that's my humble say to you okay uh, see uh, there are uh, six questions uh, in the q a box but i think uh, we would uh, be able to choose uh, uh, two only and uh, i think the one that i have chosen is uh, addressed to prashant it says uh, can a theater owner screen 60 years old movie in cinemas without permission from the producers no it's 60 years after the death of the author hmm. that's the so so that answers it uh, the second uh, question is uh, uh, from pooja uh, yedu kumar uh, it says what about liability for an intermediary which may be both that is for for example short video uh, service platforms that have majority user generated content and some self licensed or self owned content would intermediary safe harbor provision still apply to the extent of the ugc i mean it's uh, left open to whichever panelist is able to answer it whether it's a ugc or whether it's uh, you know they own the platform if you're using a copyrighted work you are liable to you know pay for it you are liable to pay the author the only point which i want to add on the ugc is that people the safe harbor provision which you mentioned is about section 79 of the information technology act where the safe harbor is only granted if you have taken reasonable uh, you know reasonable care for example your take down notice your terms and conditions for not allowing the users to upload infringing article on ugc because these are user generated content and therefore your after effect is after the content is uploaded and then you remove your take down process etc which is a requirement for your safe harbor that's my interpretation of section 79 of the it act thank you i think uh, we uh, will have to close uh, this session uh, unless prashant i think you were to say something just adding to it that under the new intermediary uh, guidance of 2021 uh, they have there's been an onus which has been uh, carved out on the on on the social media websites that uh, they have to also make efforts and when we say effort these are all bona fide efforts it has been seen that they have there are certain automated filtering tools now these filtering tools will at least make ensure that no identical content is is uploaded again which was also talked about in uh, myspace judgment but then those tools at that stage uh, which i think uh, audible magic was bring that stage and tools which are available today are drastically different you know in 13 years time uh tools have changed they are really good tools which can really enable at least the identical content to be taken out and then there's there's another difference there's there's uh, uh additional liability on those social media websites which have more than 50 lakh users in india uh so these social media website have the onus of ensuring that there's a uh there's there's chief compliance officer based out of india nodal officer in india and also a resident officer all must be uh, employees of the company and also residents in india and they have to really prompt expeditiously so efforts are being made and uh, let's see how they progress and i think the deadline to uh, 
uh, in short, these steps were taken uh, was 25th of May. February. Three were, yes, three months were granted for 25th of February, which I believe are going to, uh, yeah, we will see something. And the like same that. has been executed for e-commerce also under the consumer That's protection. Right. The only point, you know, Prashant, I would like to add with a smile is that people are not reading those rules from the uh, reasonableness. People are saying that rule also makes a provision that there should be a court order. So, yeah. <laughs> so court order is only, as I mentioned, yeah. <laughs> in fact, have to be on certain aspects. Absolutely. So it's a it's a selective option which is selected, but people have to see holistically the overall uh, uh, regulation. There has to be a balance of uh, between everything. No, no law can be perfect. If uh, and we have to involve with time. Right. You know, but the UGC concept still goes on the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, DMCA, which provided uh, season and desist, take down notice, etc. reasonableness, which flows down from your burn convention to all the provisions. So people are in that safe zone, subject to compliance under the Intermediary Act. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, I know uh, it was turning out to be a <clears throat> very interesting debate. Uh, but I have to bring it to an end uh, because time is uh, always uh, a merciless uh, arbiter of things. Uh, so I would uh, now, uh, I, I, would, I profusely thank all the panelists for their insightful uh, discussion uh, and, uh, and ideas. And uh, I now turn it over to Kavita ji for her concluding remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you, RK. So thank you to all our distinguished speakers, the Motion Pictures Association, Creative First, and the Producers Guild of India for collaborating for this very important session today. The session was indeed very engaging and insightful. I would also like to express my sincere gratitude to Lex Witness for the kind support in organizing this webinar. Once again, many thanks to all the participants who joined us for the session today. Stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.